pray with me? Creator God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> so what is your dream? What is your vision for the time that is to come? What is your dream for the next 10 years? What is your dream for 2021? For that matter, what is your vision for this week? Last year, last January, I think it was like January 5th, my first sermon of the year 2020, I asked everyone, what is your vision for 2020, the year that had just begun? Now, there are few things of certainty in this world, but I can be certain that none of us on that Sunday could have seen what the year would bring us. Between the public reaction to the coronavirus school and church closings, racial protests, and a sitting president trying to steal a federal election and decimate the United States Constitution, nobody could have foreseen what was to come. Nobody could have known what 2020 would bring. But there's a difference between having vision, having a dream, and predicting the future. Nobody could have predicted the details about the events of 2020, but people with vision were able to see that something was happening based on perceived indicators and an understanding of human behavior and act accordingly. Scientists were warning our leadership for many months, years even, prior to 2020, about the possibility of global pandemic and the need for preparedness. They had a vision of what could be and advised our leadership to be prepared. Likewise, on the stage of racial equity, the tensions of this past summer should really not be a surprise. Maybe we were not able to predict the particular killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, but those events reflect a historic pattern of racial injustice that goes back 400 years. People with vision could see that something would happen based on previous experience and a basic understanding of our active justice, economic, social, and educational systems, which are structured, structured to levy racist abuse on minority citizens. I am sure that, to the black community, the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor were shocking but no surprise. Many in the black community have vision. Not a vision of what could be, but rather a vision for what truly is. Black parents with vision have conversations with their children that white people do not have to have because of racist abuse inherent in our systems. They have vision to see the world as it truly is with the decks stacked against them and their black bodies on the line. This vision for what truly is sometimes obscures even the possibility of entertaining a vision for what could be. Sometimes simply existing is too exhausting to imagine thriving. Martin Luther King Jr., however, had a vision for what could be. Growing up the son of a black preacher in Atlanta, Georgia, he was certainly immersed in racist abuse. King's father was the pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church, where King would eventually become pastor as well, and where United States Senator Raphael Warnock is currently serving as pastor. Throughout his childhood in Atlanta, King witnessed scores of episodes of racist abuse, from segregation in schools to only being allowed to shop in certain stores. King's father, Martin Luther King Sr., led him to a realization of the possibility of equality. One incident King writes about concerns a, a playmate he had in 1935 when he was five years old, a white boy. They played together for years until they started school for the first time. Then the white boy went to the school for whites, and King went to the black school. It was at that time the white boy's parents stopped allowing him to play with King. They told him, 
we are white and you are black. You need to play with other black boys. They didn't use the word black. Confused, King asked his father about what happened, and his father sat him down and taught him about America's original sin, the sin of slavery. After hearing about this, King proclaimed then and there that he hated all white people. This was a five-year-old, remember? Well, hearing this, his father chastised him harshly. He told them that it was his duty as a Christian to love all people, regardless of the color of the skin or what they had done in the past. This was a lesson that King carried with him throughout his life, throughout his ministry, the call to love all people, even those who had harmed you. Another time, growing up, King's father took him to a shoe store in Atlanta to buy a new pair of shoes. They sat in the chair waiting for service. Finally, a clerk came up to them and told them that, since they were black, they would have to go to a different set of chairs in the rear of the store. King Sr. told the clerk that he would either buy shoes sitting right here or he would not buy shoes at all. Finally, they left the store shoeless. King Sr. told his son, I don't care how long I have to live with this system, I will not accept it. This led to King's desire to speak out against the systemic injustices that permit racist abuse to exist in our society and to resist oppression firmly but lovingly. King was a scholar. Even as a young boy, he would study the dictionary and used words to diffuse tensions among his classmates. While other boys his age were fighting, he used words. When he was a high school junior, he participated in an oratorical contest and went to the state finals. In his oratory, he said, Black America is still in chains. Even the finest Negro is at the mercy of the meanest white man. Even the winners of our highest honors still face the color barrier. He won that state oratorical contest, making him the first black child in Georgia to do so. Well, on the way home, he and his teacher rode the bus back to Atlanta. The driver ordered them to stand in the back so two white men could sit in their seats. King resisted, but his teacher told him to follow the driver's instructions. And King and his teacher wound up standing in the back of the bus all the way from Dublin, Georgia to Atlanta, some 135 miles. In the summer of 1944, after graduating high school and before going to college, he and his friends took a job working on a tobacco farm in Connecticut. This was King's first time out of the segregated South and his first glimpse of what life lived equitably could look like. He wrote letters back to his parents telling them, the white people here are very nice. We can go anywhere we want to and sit anywhere we want. Weekends, he would attend the theater sitting with white people. And on Sunday mornings, he would attend church filled with white and black congregants. King wrote back to his parents in astonish astonishment, here Negroes and whites go to the same church. The summer that he spent in Connecticut surely led to the development of his vision for equality. Well, King went on to receive his Bachelor's of Arts degree in sociology from Morehouse University and then attended Crozer Theological Seminary where he received his Bachelor's of Divinity degree and Boston University, where he see, received his doctoral degree in systematic theology on June 5th, 1955. From there, he pastored in Montgomery, Alabama for five years before returning to Atlanta, where he became pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church, along with his father. But while he was in Alabama, King was active in the Montgomery bus boycott, which began on December 5th, 1955, and lasted 385 days. This was the protest that took place after Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus so that a white man could sit down. During those 385 days, King spoke out, acted up, talked prophetically about justice and equality, and helped organize rides to and from Montgomery for black people in the service industry. Over the course of those 385 days, the tensions were so elevated that at one point, King's house was bombed. 
At another point, King was arrested. The conflict ended with the U.S. District Court ordering that racial segregation on all Montgomery's buses, public buses, be abolished. King not only won this battle, but this incident also firmly established him nationally as a civil rights leader. Now, of course, King is best known for his I Have a Dream speech, one that is read and memorized by school children around the world. That speech is about vision. It's about the vision King had for a unified country, his vision for a nation rooted in equality and justice, his vision aligned with God's vision for justice, righteousness, and shalom. In that speech, he says the following words. He says, even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of farmer slaves and the sons of farmer slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day be able to live in a nation where they are not judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. King's speech is about having a vision for a brighter tomorrow. Both of the scriptures that Mari read a few moments ago also deal with vision, with dreaming as well. In the first scripture, we hear the call of Samuel. In this story, Samuel is serving under Eli, the high priest in the temple. While resting on his pillow, Eli hears, uh, Samuel hears a call and imagines it to be Eli. Twice this happens, but the third time he recognizes it as God. When God calls for the third time, Samuel says, Speak, for your servant is listening. But Samuel, who went on to be a great servant of God, was not the one who had vision at that time. It was Eli. Young Samuel was simply confused. It was Eli who had the vision to understand, based on history and faith, what was truly happening. It was Eli who had the context to understand what God was doing and alert Samuel to what was truly happening. It was Eli who knew God, who discerned what God was doing, and who pointed Samuel to God. Eli had vision. Likewise, in our gospel lesson today, Philip had vision to follow Jesus. He tried to articulate his vision to Nathanael, but Nathanael just laughed and doubted. He said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? To which Philip simply replied, come and see. These disciples, these disciples had vision. They had vision to follow Jesus and had the inspiration to share that vision with others. By, sharing, by Philip sharing the vision with Nathaniel, Nathaniel was able to join him as a disciple as well and join him in changing the world. Philip and Nathaniel, along with the other disciples, followed Jesus, listened to his vision, articulated their own vision, learned about the importance of preaching justice, righteousness, and shalom in the world. They changed the world because they were able to envision what could be. I've uh, sometimes had difficulty with the idea of Martin Luther King Jr. Day, of him being lifted up above all others in the struggle for racial equality. Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Prince Hall, Sojourner Truth, Langston Hughes, Charles Drew, they were all pioneers in their fields, fighting for racial equity in ways that were sometimes more more, uh, effective even than King in their day. But none of them have had their birthday turn into a federal holiday. Why is it that we lift up the legacy of Dr. King over all of those others in black history? For me, 
The answer lies in the vision that Dr. King articulated and the way his vision inspired thousands, millions of people to take up the fight for racial equity and make it their own. For me, King's ability to meet people where they were and explain to them in calm and uncertain term, or certain terms why his vision of racial equality was a vision that can be shared by all. For me, King's foundation of faith strengthened his commitment to embody Jesus' mission of justice, and that faith foundation is exemplary to us as Christians. For me, I see the King vision rooted in Jesus' vision, and as a Christian, that elevates his ministry to new standards of faith. Dr. King's ministry, rooted in Jesus' ministry, was all about having vision and articulating a vision in a way that inspires others to similar ministries. Dr. King's vision inspired others to develop their own vision for how the world can be. Dr. King's vision, rooted in faith, inspired others to root their vision in faith as well. And that's why we lift him up on this day. And that is where we come in today. We are on the cusp of a new world emerging this week. This week we will see the inauguration of a leadership style that has been sorely lacking for what seems like a long, long time. A leadership style that is rooted in equity for all, justice for all, affirmation of all. As we emerge from the darkness to a place of hope, we would do well to take the example of Dr. King into our cultural expressions. Dr. King encouraged us to have vision for how the world could be and realize that when our faith and our actions work together, that vision can become a reality, that dream can be real. Dr. King articulated three evils, poverty, racism, and aggression, and rooted them in his faith. Poverty includes unemployment, hunger, illiteracy, infant mortality, basically compassion for the least of God's children. Racism includes misogyny, homophobia, colonialism, ableism, ageism, and ethnic conflict. And aggression includes war, imperialism, domestic violence, rape, terrorism, human trafficking, drugs, child abuse, and nationalism. These triple evils are the root of all that threatens the integrity of our world today. These triple evils are the root of the passions driving the domestic terrorists that committed armed insurrection against our nation's capital on Epiphany. These triple evils are the root of the actions of others who try to undo the U.S. Constitution and our democracy. These triple evils articulated by Dr. King are what keep us from fully realizing the promises of Jesus Christ in our midst, what keep us from truly realizing God's kingdom in this time and this place. It is up to each one of us as we emerge into a new world this week to be visionary, to have a dream, to know that, like Samuel, God is calling each one of us to realize that good things can come from Nazareth or even from the ashes of what our country has become and to embrace the possibility that a world can exist where people are judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. Healing is around the corner and a new world is possible. The dream will be a reality. Let us all join hands and sing a new song together. It is up to us to embrace the dream, the vision of Jesus Christ, the dream, the vision of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the call of God in our lives. We can help the sons of farmer slaves and the sons of farmer slave owners sit down together at the table of brotherhood if we just have the vision to make it happen if we just have a dream. Amen.
At this time, let us join together in verses 1 through 4 of our song, We Shall Overcome. <laughs> 